Bibles to Psalm 41. Psalm 41 will be the text we'll study for the lesson at this hour. And as you're making your way there, we will have these verses on the screen as well. But I always encourage folks to follow along in their personal copy of the Bible. You may have a different translation than I'm going to be using. That can provide, uh, be very helpful in looking at different ways words are interpreted or translated. But before we uh, actually get into the specifics of this study, uh, I do want to make this observation as you look at your copy of the Bible. You may or may not see this. I don't see this in my uh, particular copy of the King James Version. It may depend on the publisher. But at the end of Psalm 41, you may see Book 2. You may see a heading that says Book 2. And we may already know this, but the book of Psalms has been traditionally divided into five books. Now, this for organization purposes. Psalms is the longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters or Psalms. And so some thought maybe to make it a bit easier to find things, we'll take the 150 and divide them into five, much like uh, the Bible is divided into chapter verse divisions, again, for our benefit for helping find Scripture quickly. And that may be why we have five books within the one book of Psalms. This is not a salvation issue. Uh, it's just merely an organization issue. But that's, that's the meaning if you see book two there after Psalm 41 and before Psalm 42. <laughs> now the tiny print of the superscription tells us that this is a Psalm of David. He wrote about half of the 150. The context of Psalm 41 tells us, as does our title, that David is a man suffering as he, by inspiration, writes this words. He is both broken and betrayed as of these events. One has noted that adversity reveals a person's soul. Adversity, trouble, suffering, pain, how we respond to all of that says a whole lot about us. And it says a whole lot about how David handles this on this occasion. He rises above the occasion in a wonderful way, and we uh, certainly expect that of, of this man of God. In Psalm 41, we don't know all the particulars, but we do know that David is facing what we might call a double hardship. I mean, he's getting it from both sides, as we would say. First of all, he is battling some type of unspecified illness. Once again, we're not given the particulars. We don't know the specifics as to the exact nature of this disease or sickness or illness that he has. But as if that is not bad enough, second, David is dealing with affliction by his enemies and what we might call a turncoat friend, a friend who's going to betray him. So again, to summarize what we're about to study, David, as of Psalm 41, is for whatever reason seriously ill. He is surrounded by people who are pretending to be his friends, but they inwardly hope he dies. One close friend especially wanted to do him harm. Now what David is going to do, and we're going to see as we study, he's going to first of all turn to God and acknowledge God's blessing in his life. He is going to confess his sin. He is going to, having shown mercy to the weak, now he's going to ask God, God, will you show mercy or pity on me? And then he'll pray that God will uphold him now and forever. That's sort of a summation of what we have in Psalm 41 and what we will study. We'll see that the thrust of these verses is this. The godly person is blessed even when dealing with severe troubles. The godly person, now we, we emphasize the word godly. The godly person is blessed even when dealing with troubles. Again, David is a man broken. He is a man betrayed. But all the while, he is a man richly blessed by God. This psalm tells us not only a lot about David, it also tells us a lot about the God that he and we both love and serve. God genuinely cares for us, even when it seems our world is collapsing all around us. And remembering this fact that God cares about us 
can help us deal with some mighty tough times that we often face in life. So we want to look at Psalm 41 and not only see David, but we want to see ourselves in light of Psalm 41. We don't want to just exegete these verses and leave without saying, what does this mean for me and for you? We're going to outline these 13 verses in five sections. David's reward, verses 1 to 3. His request, verse 4. His reproach, 5 through 9. His renewal, 10 through 12. And then wrapping up with rejoicing, verse 13. We'll go back now and get those one at a time. Number one, David's reward. Notice Psalm 41, verse 1. And again, if you have a different translation, you may have a different word. Uh, way of rendering some of these words, but the meaning is the same. Blessed is he that considers the poor, the needy, the hurting. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Note that this psalm begins with the word blessed. This is a beatitude. Psalm 1, the very first of the 150 songs, likewise began with a beatitude or a blessing. Psalm 1 says the godly man will be blessed because of his character. This psalm says the godly man will be blessed because of his compassion toward those who are poor, toward those who are hurting, toward those who are suffering. Now we want to again consider this in the context in which it is written. Note that David himself is suffering tremendously as he writes these words, but note what he's doing. He's turning his attention to others who are suffering. Here's a man broken. Here's a man betrayed. What is he doing? He's thinking about others who are likewise broken and may be betrayed and hurting in various ways. And this, of course, reminds us that no matter how bad we think we have it, there is always someone else who has it worse than we have. And whenever we are hurting... If we will concentrate on others who are hurting, this can help us alleviate some of the pain and the hurt. But sometimes what we like to do is we like to wallow in our self-pity. And we don't take notice of the hurts of others. I've been on my feet all day long. That's a tough day. But then you think about the poor girl who's lied, who has to lie in bed all day because she's paralyzed from the neck down and would give anything to be on her feet. I just lost my job. That's tough. Think about the poor man who just lost his wife. That's tougher. When we are hurting, David says it is helpful to think of others who likewise are hurting. Too often we may be guilty of what might be called one-upping. We always have it worse, we think, than the other. You say you've been suffering well, let me tell you about my sufferings. Something happened to you. Well, you need to hear what happened to me. We don't listen to them and their hurt and their troubles. All we focus is on ourselves. And then again, we need to listen and we need to help those who are in times of trouble. That's one lesson we want to take from Psalm 41. That's what David is doing. I'm hurting, but let me also think of others who are hurting. This is the Old Testament counterpart to the Beatitude of Matthew 5. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It is the old adage of what goes around comes around, but here in a good way. If I sow mercy to others, odds are I'm going to reap mercy in return. David is hurting to help ease the hurt. He considers others who are hurting. And in the process, he is blessed. As David defended the weak and poor, God is going to defend David. We don't want to leave this verse without the reminder that Scripture is replete with admonitions for the godly to be mindful and helpful toward those who are hurting. Whether they be poor, whether they be sick, whether they be in need, again, we are to visit come to the aid of the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. That is, James says, pure and undefiled religion. James 1, 27. Be mindful of those who are hurting. Verse 2, the Lord will preserve him. Who will the Lord preserve? 
the one who is mindful of the poor, who considers the poor. Well, the Lord will preserve him. You show mercy toward others, I'm going to show mercy toward you. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed on the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Here are more spiritual blessings that then come to the merciful person. We don't want to take these verses as a blanket life of good to everybody who shows mercy. That is, if I help somebody in need, that means I'll never have any trouble in my life. That's not what this context is saying. We know, for instance, that Job was a man who bestowed mercy on the hurting, and yet his world collapsed all around him. But in a general sense, if you care for others, God will see to it that you are cared for, is what the psalmist is saying. The Lord sustains him on his sick bed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. This leads us to believe, and the following verses will attest to the fact, David is somehow very sick for whatever reason. And he appeals to God for full health. Before we go further and note more about David from Psalm 41, take just a mental excursion and consider some other biblical examples of people who were rewarded for their faith in times of illness. I think about Hezekiah. Hezekiah had a fatal illness. In fact, he was told, you're about to die. And Hezekiah was brokenhearted, and he prayed, and he prayed fervently, and his sickness was healed. I think about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How that is, the text says, God restored them. God protected them from the lion's den, from the fiery furnace. You think about Esther and the Jews. They were, as Adam said this morning, they were delivered by God from the evil plots of Haman. And we sing the song, Our God is able to deliver thee. Words we need to take to heart and sing with meaning in light of what David says in Psalm 41. Again, David's reward. Let's start with the good, David says, before dealing with the negative. Notice second, now David makes his request to God in verse number four. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Verses one to three, I have been merciful unto others. Now, please, Lord, repay me with mercy. Be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Notice first, David's request is for pity. That is, be merciful or full of pity toward me. Now, if I have not extended mercy to others, then I really can't pray this prayer, can I? I cannot ex expect to receive mercy if I haven't been doling it out to others all along the way. But David has. His request is for pity. Notice his request is for healing of the soul. Be merciful unto me. His body is sick, but the most important thing he wants healed is his soul. Heal my soul. Folks, I don't care if we have the best medical care on the planet. We are going to die. This old tabernacle that we have is going to turn back to the dust from which it came. And though we may be healed physically, and doctors may prop us up and help us and keep us going for a time, one day that's going to end. The most important healing is the healing of the soul, the inner man, the spirit that lives forever, that will one day stand before God and give account of the life lived in this life. That's the most important healing there is. Now, this healing is brought about, as we know, by the great physician, Jesus, who died for us, who longs to forgive us and to heal the soul. The reason David needs healing of the soul is the same reason we need it. For pardon, I have sinned. I have sinned. Whatever David's problem, he knows it is of his own making. It's a consequence of his wrongdoing. Now, if this be the occasion where he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who tried to usurp the throne and steal the throne of Israel from his father, 
then that certainly would be because of David's sins with Bathsheba. The adultery, the murder, and then the cover up. It may be that David does not have one specific sin in mind. He may be talking about sin in general. I mean, when you're staring death in the face, probably you rehearse all the sins you've ever committed and bring those before the attention of God who knows all those things anyway. In this case, whatever David's problems, he knows is a direct result of his sin. Not all sickness is a direct result of our sin. People who come down with COVID, usually that has nothing to do with sin. People who come down with cancer, usually that has nothing whatever to do with sin. Sometimes sickness just happens and we understand that. But sometimes we are in trouble and it is our fault. So it is with David here. And regardless, either way, we all have to say those three hard words, but necessary words, I have sinned. I am a sinner. I'm a part of the all who has fallen short and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Without that confession, I have sinned. There is no forgiveness. There is no healing. There is no pardon. And so, what a noble request we all must make. Third, notice now the specific situation that David is in. The reproach he is facing, even though at this point he is very ill and maybe about ready to die. First of all, his enemies belittle him. They kick him when he's down in this situation. Notice verse 5. Mine enemies speak evil of me. And notice the question they're asking. When shall he die and his name perish? These people hate him so much, they can't wait for him to die. They hope he dies. And that is hatred to the nth degree. That is not having a godlike spirit. That is not the attitude of Christ or of true Christians. Surely none in the assembly this morning are hoping that anyone dies. You would really have to hate somebody to hope that they die. That's what these enemies are thinking of David here. Again, they would kick a man when he's down. Sheer hatred, no pity for the hurting. And I'm afraid we're living in a society where we see evidence of that more and more each day. Allow me to borrow Adam's blowout illustration. Sometimes preachers, we struggle with finding illustrations, and so we get illustrations from, from life. And as Adam said, he had a blowout uh, Thursday and called me, and I went to assess the situation. That's the first thing you do is just sort of size up the situation. Is the tire really flat? Well, it was flat on the bottom. I started to say, Adam, you know, the tire's just flat on the bottom. If you can drive it on the top, you'll make it home. But <laughs> that wasn't the time for uh, jesting uh, on, that, on that occasion. I said, first of all, we need to go home and change clothes. We both have our good clothes on. We don't want to face the wrath of Tanya for ruining these good clothes. So we went home and changed clothes, and I got my floor jack and my trusty DeWalt driver because we wanted to get that tire changed fast as fast we could he had pulled about as far off the road as was feasible about four feet this is highway 45 folks four lane 4 30 in the afternoon just north of the brewer exit a busy time of the day and naturally the tire that went flat was on the side of the traffic not the other side but the side of the traffic and as we changed that tire, four feet away, you could just about reach out there. He said 65, I think maybe 165. That's what it felt like. You could feel the wind just about knock you down. And as he said, people would not get in the other lane. They would not slow. It seemed like they sped up instead of slowing down. And it is, it is a day. You, you just don't look. You don't look. You just... Whip it off, whip the spare on, get it done, and uh, as fast as you can. And 
a reminder. Think of folks who are hurting or who are in need or in tough situations. People get killed doing what we did. Sarasota, Florida, back in July, four people were killed changing a flat on the side of I-75. A lot of car makers today do not put spare tires in new cars anymore. One reason is because they say a fuel economy. Another reason is, uh, we're told at least, the danger of changing a tire on the side of a road. You're taking your life in your hands because people don't care. They don't care. I want to get to where I want to get, and I want to get there as quick as possible. You've got trouble? Well, tough luck. I'm not going to slow down, and I'm not going to get over. Again, that's sort of kicking people when they're down. That's what David's facing here. He has a much more serious dilemma than a flat tire on the side of the road. Here's a man, some would say, on his sick bed, maybe almost his deathbed. His enemies have no compassion, though he's very sick. Verse 6, Now my friends, quote, friends come to see me. They just spout off empty words. David, I sure hope you get better. That's not what they're thinking. Inwardly, they're thinking, we hope you die. He utters empty words. His heart gathers iniquity. And he leaves visiting me and goes out and tells it abroad, Oh, David, David's a bad man. That's why he's on his sick bed. They pretend sympathy. They pretend friendship. They're hoping death. What's the old saying with friends like these? You don't need enemies, right? Notice they plot against him. Verse 7, all that hate me whisper. They're not, not going to talk to his face. They whisper against me. Against me that it advise my hurt. An evil disease say they cleave fast unto him. David has an evil disease because he's an evil man, is what they're saying. And now that he lieth, that his life down, He's going to die. He's not going to rise up anymore. He's about dead, and they're glad of it. They're planning his funeral, and they're happy as they plan his funeral. No compassion, whatever. He's not going to die. He's not going to recover. Up. He's going to die, and they're happy about it. Can you imagine being very sick in the hospital, and your doctor comes in and says, I hope you die? Or the nurses who wait on you, you look awful today. You're about dead, aren't you? Or your friends come in and say the same thing. What kind of encouragement is that? That's exactly what David is facing and hearing on this occasion. This is hatred personified. To hate somebody so much, you hope they go ahead and die. Now, to add insult to injury, probably the worst pain of all is the next. Well, we... Proverbs 16, 28 speaks of a whisperer separating close friends. That goes with, with what these were doing, whispering together against me. But again, probably the, the greatest pain of all was his friend betrays him. Yes, my own familiar friend turned against me. I trusted him. We ate meals together. He has lifted up his heel against me. Now, again, we're talking here about a close friend. We're not talking about just a passing acquaintance. We're not talking about somebody David sees every once in a while that he knows in that sense. We're talking about a close friend, one in whom David has confided, one in whom David had a lot of trust. Again, they've been together. He ate of my bread. They ate meals together. Maybe they fished together. Maybe they hunted together. Again, this close friend has turned against him. The text says he lifted up his heel, the image of a horse, lifting up its heel to kick of the owner in rebellion. That's the idea behind the phrase here. Now, initially, in this context, probably David's referring to a fellow by the name of Ahithophel. That is another lesson for another time, Adam, we'll get to that in 2 Samuel. Ahithophel had been David's friend and counselor, but when Absalom rebelled and again tried to take the throne, Ahithophel left David and went over to the side of the enemy. In spite of all they've been through, in spite of their closeness, in spite of their friendship, Ahithophel is a turncoat friend, as we said at the beginning of the lesson. So initially, 
that more than likely refers to Ahithophel, but this verse has a prophetic meaning, as you know. Prophetically, this is a reference to Judas and Jesus. What this friend did to David is a type of what a thousand years later Judas Iscariot would do to Jesus Christ. In fact, in John 13, Jesus will quote this very passage and say as much. He's saying to the, the apostles gathered, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. What scripture? Psalm 41, 9. That that scripture may be fulfilled. David was not only talking about a hippophobe. I don't know that David knew it or not, but by inspiration, he was talking about Judas Iscariot. The scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth the bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. We may have through the years underemphasized the significance of Judas betraying Jesus. We may have the idea that Judas was simply a rogue apostle that nobody liked to start with. Well, that's just simply not the case. Jesus and Judas. Judas was a friend to Jesus, like Ahithophel was a friend to David. And of course, Judas was a turncoat friend, as we've said, and how that must have hurt. You may have had a close friend turn against you, and if so, you may know a bit of the pain that both David and Jesus, our Lord, felt. But remember, it is far better to be hurt by another than to be the one doing the hurting. Never forget, far better to be hurt than to be the one actually doing the hurting. Notice, in the fourth place, David prays for renewal. He's on his sickbed. He's surrounded by enemies, hoping he dies. His own friend is turned against him. I need renewal, verse 10. But thou, O Lord, in, in contrast to what these are doing and have done, but thou, O Lord, please show me mercy. Raise me up that I may requite or repay them. So first of all, a renewal with power denoted by the phrase, raise me up. A plea to get out of the bed of sickness. Now he's already prayed for healing of the soul and forgiveness. And now he's alluding to being raised physically from that sick bed. We know from history, from the record, that God answered that prayer. That David did recover from this. We see that from his life. Notice next though that he says, raise me up that I may requite. You may have a translation that says, repay them. Now that initially may seem to be out of character for David, as if David is saying, I want to get well so I can take vengeance on these, my enemies. But it might simply be talking about here, when I ascend back to the throne, I need to administer justice to those who again have done damage to the kingdom of Israel. That may be what he's talking about. Others think that this phrase still goes with the prophecy concerning Jesus. And when you look at Luke chapter 21, 27, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Not long after those words were said, Jerusalem was leveled, and the Jews, the Jews who rebelled, were indeed requited or repaid. Either way, the point, the point is made, a renewal to power. Verse 11, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me, a renewal with protection. I am confident, all the confidence in the world in God, my enemy will not triumph. He knew that from experience. Goliath did not triumph over him. Saul would not triumph over David. And on down the line, you can go. So utter confidence in God that God will deliver and that God will protect. Verse 12, as for me, thou uphold, upholdest me in mine integrity and settest me before thy face forever. And again, renewal with purity. Because he had confessed his sins, he stood before God with integrity. Such would never have been. Had he continued the cover-up, 
had he continued the denial, had he blamed others and pointed at others, but he said, I have sinned. He's been forgiven as of Psalm 41, 12. He can stand before God pure because God has forgiven him. History reveals that David's confidence in God was well-placed. Confidence in God is always well-placed. Finally, the last verse, or last point, David's rejoicing, verse 13. Blessed be the God, Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. This word blessed is used in two ways in, in the book of Psalms, or in this psalm rather. First of all, an expression of congratulation. That's verse 1. Blessed is the man who considers the poor. But in this verse is the expression of adoration. David's not congratulating God. He is adoring God because of who God is, what God has done, and the love and the mercy of God. <clears throat> Folks, adoring the God of Israel is appropriate. It was then, and it is today, because Israel today, if we're in the church, we are the Israel of God today. We are the chosen of God today, those who are Christians. And again, we adore God as a result. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. That is God's praise. Praise given to God ought to be forever. From eternity past to eternity future. From everlasting to everlasting. And then the closing words, amen and amen. That is, may it be so. You may wonder why two amens. Wouldn't one amen be sufficient? Well, in the Hebrew language, as in a lot of languages, Words are repeated for emphasis' sake. A moment ago, David expressed the idea of being raised up. And in our language, we say that's redundant. You don't need to add up to raise. If you're raising something that's going up, don't say raise up. But again, in biblical language, sometimes words are repeated for emphasis' sake, for intensity. And that's the reason for the double amen to end this song. May this be especially so, as David concludes. Now, broken, betrayed, but blessed, what does David tell us from Psalm 41? What can we leave to make us better from a study of these verses? Some reminders. Number one, David says, have sympathy on the hurting. Even if you are hurting, think of others. You're not the only one hurting. Focus on the hurts of others can help take our minds off our own hurts. Lesson one. Second, like David, we must acknowledge we are sinners. Things will never get better, spiritually speaking especially, until we just bow before God and make that statement, I have sinned. Sometimes we make that statement before others because we've sinned against others. But initially, our sins are against the God of heaven. Those sins need to be confessed. Those sins need to be renounced. And, of course, we need to be forgiven. If I'm a child of God, well, certainly I have advantage of prayer and repentance that I can be forgiven, as David is praying here. We need to pray, David says. We need to pray. Ought not be a day that goes by that we don't spend several minutes talking to our Father in heaven, praying to a God infinitely bigger than any problems we are facing. Fourth, we need to continue to live according to God's will. There is no excuse for unfaithfulness. No matter how badly others may be treating us, no matter how in the wrong direction our life seems to be going, how badly we may hurt it, be hurting, there is no excuse for unfaithfulness. Continue to live according to God's will. Now we can sum all this up in two points. True fulfillment in life is found in true oneness with God. We become one with God when we're part of the family of God. To get in the family of God is a matter of faith in Jesus Christ being God's Son. It is a matter of confessing I'm a sinner and having remorse from and turning from our sins and repentance. It is a matter of confessing Jesus before men that he's the Son of God. 
It is a matter then of simply allowing somebody to take our physical bodies and immersing them in water in baptism that every sin might be washed away. And like David, we can stand before God with integrity, not because of who we are, but because of what Christ has done for us. True fulfillment in life is found in true oneness then with the God of heaven. And then finally, the Christian must always take the high road. Always take the high road. Do not allow the devil to pull you down to your level. Respond to evil with good. David, our, Adam talked about that in the Bible class this morning. We don't collaborate. This just happened to work out this way that these lessons sort of mesh together. But if we take the high road, even if we find ourselves broken and betrayed by others, if we take the high road, we can still be blessed by God nonetheless. So think on these things. Respond if you need to this morning as we stand and as we sing.